Wow, it's quieted down. <laughs> that must mean it's showtime. <laughs> Good afternoon and welcome to the 2012 Fall AGU meeting. I'm Mike McFadden, president of the American Geophysical Union. For 45 years, scientists from around the world have converged on the fall meeting to hear about the latest discoveries in geophysics, to present their current research, to develop new collaborations, and to meet old friends. This year, we are expecting over 22,000 attendees, and it will be the biggest fall meeting ever. During the course of the week, you'll hear about innovative and groundbreaking research on the solar system, deep space, the oceans, solid earth, the atmosphere, the biosphere, climate, and how, and how all these natural elements of the world interact with one another. One special highlight coming up on Wednesday is Sir Bob Watson's Frontiers of Geophysics lecture on climate change. Another highlight on Thursday will be when Dr. Subra Suresh, director of the National Science Foundation, will present this year's agency lecture. In addition to this feast of scientific presentations, we are offering a wide variety of events designed to enhance the fall meeting experience. I'd like to mention just a few of them. Tomorrow we'll feature a panel discussion with a team from James Cameron's Deep Sea Challenge Expedition. On Wednesday, there will be a town hall to unveil AGU's new code of conduct to provide guidance for members on professional ethics. And on Thursday, there will be a special session focusing on scientists' role in natural hazards risk assessments sparked by the October conviction of Italian seismologists in the wake of the Aquila earthquake. We also will feature sessions on science communication, science education, and career building opportunities for students, early career scientists, and job seekers. So there's something for everyone. In fact, maybe a little bit too much. Uh, the, the programming is so extensive that we have expanded our virtual meeting offerings of electronic posters, video on demand for high profile sessions, and live streaming for some key events, including this one. I've been coming to the fall meeting now for more than 30 years. It is always tremendously exciting. And it's in part, of course, because of the strength of our scientific program. But the dynamic city of San Francisco, with its unique cultural, culinary, and historical attractions, is also a key part of what makes our meeting so successful. We deeply appreciate the city's support and have a special guest to welcome us today in Mayor Edwin Lee. So if we can roll the video. Hello, I'm Mayor Ed Lee, and I would like to welcome all of the Earth and space scientists, educators, <coughs> students, and leaders with the American Geophysical Union to San Francisco. I'm sorry I can't be there with all of you this morning. On behalf of the city and county of San Francisco, I wanted to take the time and thank you for attending the 45th annual American Geophysical Union Fall Meeting. We appreciate your 45 years of support and partnership with San Francisco and are delighted that you continue to return to our city, the innovation capital of the world. In the next few days, you will gather with colleagues, present groundbreaking research and learn from each other while embracing the joy of science. As mayor of this great city, it is my hope that this conference will help the members of the American Geophysical Union foster new ideas that can help change the world. Again, thank you for choosing San Francisco. I wish you all a very successful meeting. Well, please join me in thanking Mayor Lee for that warm welcome. Yeah. With membership in AGU only $50, we have to convince him to join. <laughs> the idea behind the Presidential Forum is to feature a speaker from outside the mainstream of scientific specialists who can reflect on our science, its broader relevance to society, and the role it plays in world events. Today's speaker is such a person, and I'm pleased to welcome Ira Flato to, del to deliver the 2012 Presidential Lecture. But <laughs> He's not coming out yet. I have to embarrass him with a few uh, introductory comments, <laughs> uh, many of which you may know already. Ira currently serves as the host of National, National Public Radio's Talk of the Nation, Science Friday, bringing radio and internet listeners a lively, informative discussion on science, technology, health, space, and the environment. 
Mixing his passion for science with an engaging personal style, he describes his mission as making science and technology a topic for discussion around the dinner table. Ira has shared his enthusiasm with, us, with science and the public for over 35 years. He's written two popular books about science, is host of a four-part PBS series in, entitled Big Ideas, and his Science Friday Kids Connection web pages have won accolades for translating his Science Friday program, pr programming into curriculum for middle school teachers. There's a lot more I could say about Ira, but I think the best thing now is to bring him out on stage and let him speak for himself. So please, Ira, will you join us? On Thank you very much for inviting me here. Um, I, I'm sure some of you, thank you, Frank, for that great introduction. I'm sure some of you are familiar with Science Friday. San Francisco is our single biggest audience in the country for Science Friday, so I very, feel very much at home here, and I'm glad to be here. And uh, this is one of my favorite places to come to in, in the United States. Um, yeah, I, we, we do Science Friday every week, and we have podcasts and all kinds of stuff. And I wanted to talk to you today uh, about interesting stuff that we have seen and what we do and how science is sexy and becoming sexy and popular, even on its own. But I thought I'd share with you first a, a photo. This comes right out of a NASA photo. Today there was a news conference that NASA was having at Ames about a discovery that was being made on Mars that was being shown today about uh, what the Mars rover, the new one, was uh, looking at and you see this picture, this is an official NASA photo of a face on Mars. Of course, it comes from 1979, and a lot of you are not old enough to remember that. And who remembers the face on Mars? Yeah. It turned out that those were just strange shadows, and uh, if you, when you got a closer look from a different angle, it didn't really, didn't really turn into that, but I thought that would be funny if NASA released this photo today about what... What it actually, because you know, there was this rumor about a great discovery that was going to be announced this morning, and it didn't happen. So, as little, I thought I'd make my own discovery that was being shown. But what I want to talk to you today is about, is about how we have now gotten into an era where everybody is trying to make science popular, to give scientists more exposure to the public, to make it more interesting science and critical thinking, but something is happening by itself that's bubbling up from the ground, so to speak, from grassroots, and that is smart. Science is becoming sexy again. In fact, if you look at it in different places, you can see that there are websites where science is sexy. There are T-shirts talking about science is awesome. There are guys in rock bands. There are people who say, I love geeks, and this is what the, you know, the new science sexy is. In fact... This guy, anybody know who the guy in the Mohawk is? Yeah, Bob Ferdowski. And Bob has now become an internet overnight hit with the entertainment crew. I mean, I'm going to show you a little video if there's, if there's anything you need to know about how science is becoming sexy in the popular medium. Watch this interview. Trending. The world was captivated, millions of live streams online by Mars Curiosity landing on Mars last night. But one man did capture the web's attention. He actually became the Mohawk Man. I'm joined right now from JPL in Los Angeles, California by Bobek Ferdowski. How are you, Bobek? I'm good. Uh, still li living the dream. I mean, this is an amazing experience and... Uh, uh, just can't believe it still happened last night. And as much as, you know, if my mohawk gets a few more people excited about science and this mission, that's awesome. That's what it's all about. Can you show me it? Can you do me that profile shot? But yeah. So people know it is you that I'm talking to. <laughs> you are the mohawk man. Uh, yeah. Have you seen all of this? I've seen uh, a couple of the memes, of course, and, I, you know, they're hilarious. I just, I can't help uh, but laugh at that. I'm hoping, you know, if... if whatever comes of this, I hope it encourages a lot of people to get into the you know, math and science and technology and engineering stuff. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun and you know, you don't have to, you don't have to look like the guys in the skinny ties and the white shirts and the, the horn rimmed glasses, although I'm wearing my glasses today. Um, but you can, yeah, you can be whatever you want and uh, as long as you, you know, have a passion for this thing, it's, uh, it's a great job. 
So this is sort of the new face of science, Bob, and, and other people who are showing that, that science is sexy. Now, science wasn't always sexy. <laughs> you know, this was, uh, uh, science used to be, and this is the iconic picture of Albert Einstein. It was a wrinkled guy with a bad hair day. And people would have this picture up all over the place. In fact, Hollywood adopted this science role model. This is, of course, young Frankenstein with Gene Wilder starring in it. You had Back to the Future, you know, that whole range of where science was old white-haired guys who were doing science at that time. Of course, many of us grew up with science like this for youngsters. It was not very sexy. This is Mr. Wizard back in the 1950s. Don Herbert, he, he tried to uh, motivate kids in our living rooms to better understand science by watching other kids do some science. And here's a very famous experiment where he tried to show how you can't light a, uh, you can't light a, a $10 bill or a dollar bill because it's surrounded by copper and the copper draws the heat away. But there you go. So, so science was relegated to people who were demonstrating things. You had people in museums. Here's uh, Bassam Shakashiri, if you know him, he's probably the most well-known NSF science demonstrator doing things uh, in the public. He would show off colors and different things changing as chemistry sets happened. He were, the guy who really made science sexy for the first time was Carl Sagan. You remember, you remember Carl Sagan with his good looks, his turtleneck, his distinctive speech mannerisms and his, his groundbreaking series, Cosmos, which actually was the most popular show on television for many years worldwide. More people watched Cosmos than any other show. Uh, science, he was the one who made science sexy. But in those days, if you, if you talk to Andrean these days and ask why was Carl doing what he was doing, she will tell you that uh, at that time, half the planet scientists Half the planet's physicists were involved in creating and maintaining 50,000 nuclear weapons at that time. That's what they made their living doing. And Carl was trying to change the direction of where that was going. And now that the Cold War is over and uh, the challenges are facing our country, they're, they're much different. For example, 40% of the population think that the Flintstones are real. That the, you know, the Earth is is only a few thousand years old, and that people actually lived with the dinosaurs, and that the people rode around in dinosaurs and kept them as pets. The, they think that the Grand Canyon is only 6,000 years old. I'm sure you've heard these arguments before as geologists, as people who are Earth scientists, and think that, that the, the Great Gorge was caused by Noah's flood. There are people, 53% of the population, don't know that this Earth goes around the sun in 365 days. These are basic questions of science that people really have not sunk their teeth into. 51% believe in UFOs, and of course you know that that is a lenticular cloud. Of course you did. And you'll know the answer to the next question, of course. This is a video that was taken about 20 years ago at Harvard. It was an Annenberg project called A Private Universe. And they asked a very simple question. They went out to the smartest college, next to Stanford, of course, the smartest college <laughs> in the East Coast, and they set up a TV camera, and they captured every person who was graduating that day, anybody with a cap and gown on, Anybody who was visiting anybody with a cap and gown on, they, they collected about 30 people all, and he stuck them in front of a camera, and they asked them one simple question. Why is it hotter in the summer than it is in the winter? Think about it. Let's see if you geologists have it right, or scientists. Earth travels around Here's the, the answer. sun, it gets nearer to the sun, um, which produces warmer weather and gets farther away, which produces colder weather. And, then, and hence the seasons. How hot it is or how cold it is at any given time of the year has to do with the, the, the closeness of the Earth to the sun during the seasonal periods. The Earth goes around the sun. <laughs> and, and it gets hotter when we get closer to the sun and it gets colder when we get farther away from the sun. These graduates, like many of us, think of the Earth's orbit as a highly exaggerated ellipse. Even though the Earth's orbit is very nearly circular, with distance producing virtually no effect on the seasons, 
we carry with us the strong, incorrect belief that changing distance is responsible for the seasons. I took uh, physics, planetary motion, and relativity, and electromagnetism, and waves. I've never really had a scientific background whatsoever, and I, and I got through school without having it. I've gotten very far without having it. And there's the problem. <laughs> you don't have to take a scientific course. You don't have to even know why it's hotter in the summer than it is in the winter. You know, I don't think there was a follow-up question to that, why is it colder in Australia than it is, why is it winter there? And of course you know the answer, all of you knew the answer. It's because the earth is tilted. In fact, didn't you wonder when you were in grammar school when the teacher had a, de you know, on her desk, she, he or she had a, a globe and it always was going like this with the little rod going through the ends and it was always tilted on the side, why was that? But 30% of people, only 30% of people who, go, who graduate college these days actually have a, taken a course in science, a single course in science. And there's one of the problems about science and, 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 and making people understand science and the scientific issues that we as journalists and you as scientists face all the time is how, to, you know, how do you overcome some of these barriers. Another barrier is that the media that we once depended on to, to bring us science news every day that media is shrinking very rapidly. Uh, back, back in, 2000 and, uh, in 2008, CNN shuttered its science, space, and technology unit. They fired Miles O'Brien. He went over to uh, PBS because there wasn't going to be a lot of science they thought that needed to be covered. Even the main media, I'm going to show you a little clip from NBC News. Even the main media doesn't really get it doesn't really understand our interest in science. And in fact, I'm going to show you a clip. I want you to tell me your reaction to what you see or hear that is really interesting about this clip. It, I'll set it up for you. It came off a nightly news report the day before the population clock that they keep the record of the population was turning to 300 million. And Brian Williams came on TV and told us the next morning that was going to happen. We are back this Monday night with NBC News In-Depth, an American milestone. It will take place across this country tomorrow morning, and if you didn't know it was coming, there's no way you would know. It wasn't all that long ago, November 20th of 1967, President Lyndon Johnson was giving a speech at the Commerce Department in Washington. The crowd started to applaud, noticing what was going on behind him. The president turned around just as the huge digital population counter above him, state-of-the-art at the time, cranked the estimated U.S. population to 200 million. A lot of Americans thought we had grown just about as big as we ought to get. But of course, we didn't stop there. Well, tomorrow morning at 7.46 a.m. Eastern Time, and don't ask us how they estimate it, the U.S. population will click over to 300 million. You heard it. Do you know how much the budget of NBC News is? How many millions of dollars they spend on researching the news? Don't ask me how they know that. <laughs> is this the trend in news? Don't ask me the details. Don't ask me. I'm not interested. Very interestingly enough, I happened to be watching that. I had my TiVo on, so I TiVoed that show. And I said, how hard is it to explain how you know this? Maybe Katie Couric's TV show on CBS could give us some sort of insight into it. Are they going to ask us, don't how you know? America moves one person closer. And number 300 million could come by birth, by oath, that I will support and defend as a legal immigrant, or by stealth, someone sneaking into history. Any way of telling who number 300 million is going to be? No, there really isn't, because we don't count every single birth in the United States, and we don't count each person as they cross the border either direction. It's, it's a statistical thing. Now, we take, why, why was it so hard to explain that? In fact, they did that on NBC three times in a row. They went out to, they went out to a hospital in the Bronx that, that evening and picked some child out who was going to be the 300th millionth person. And then later on in the evening news, later on, 24 hours after that first one, they said again, don't ask us how we know this, how anybody knows this. This is troubling. I mean, is this done on purpose? 
Is it to bond with couch potatoes to say, you know, maybe these people are like me. They don't care how to know it. They don't want to know it. They don't care to know it. This is a troubling trend because what's most interesting about science is a Pew study shows that people are not getting enough science. They want more science in their news coverage. Way there at the bottom, on the right-hand side, under scientific news and discoveries, that graph on the right side shows that 44%, most people surveyed in this, said that that topic that does not get enough attention, most of them said, is science, news, and discoveries. They don't get enough attention in the media. Why is that? So how can we, here's a, here's a teen survey of society's top contributors. Teenagers know about science. They're interested in it. They show that, uh, that, that doc, teachers, doctors, and scientists are among society's top contributors. They realize the value of science. Why is it that we, you know, the media doesn't realize? This is one of the most interesting studies that came out just a couple of years ago called the 95% Solution. It was done by John Falk and Lynn Deerking, and they discovered that school is not where most Americans learn about their science. Maybe you understood this. They only get about 5% five, 5 of their education about science over their lifetime, drip, 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 comes from different places, and most of those places are not in school. Where are they getting their science? They're getting their science from science museums and aquaria. They're getting their science from taking field trips, looking at the birds, like, as in this slide. They're getting their science from the internet. They're learning about there your rocks and your elements and things on the internet. People are not getting their science from the normal places. And that presents good challenges to all, the, all of us who, have to, who want to give people science and science communications. Where do you go? Where do people hang out? If, if you want to reach people, you have to go to where they're hanging out. You have to go to them without waiting for them to find you because there are a lot of places they could go to, find them, seek them out. You can use the resources of mass media, social media, public events. How do we cultivate new public scientists? How do we find the new... Carl Sagan's of our day or other scientists who will speak out and become the public leaders to talk about science and important science issues facing society. How do you help people wade through this tsunami of information to find trusted sources? Who, 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 who can they trust to find out how old the earth is or what, what, about, uh, what the facts are about global warming and climate change? How do you find the partners who think like you do? Finding partners who think like you do so you can have a synergy with them to help talk about science. And are you willing to think differently and actually take new chances for getting science out to the public? Well, these are some of the challenges that are facing us. And let me go through a few of these challenges and some of the answers I found. Where do the people hang out? Well, one of the places, the, one of the famous places for, for decades where people hang out is on TV. They watch TV. So if you want to reach those couch potatoes, find talented scientists who are great at presenting stuff on TV. Use those people. They don't have to be Nobel Prize winners. Eric, a Nobel Prize winner, Eric Kandel, said the ability to communicate an idea is an, as important as the idea itself. And you don't have to be somebody you know, who is considered to be a leader uh, in, in their community. Let me give you an example, one of my favorite from years ago. I'll give you a couple of my favorites. Who's ever heard of Grace Hopper? You remember who Grace Hopper was? Yeah. She invented the first computer compiler in 1952, and uh, she invented the language COBOL. And it was her idea that programs could be written in a language that was close to English. In fact, she has another little thing that I think she might be famous for. This is a page from her lab book. And that little yellow thing is a piece of scotch tape. Another of the scotch tape is a moth. And she wrote in her lab book, first actual case of a bug being found <laughs> in an adjacent relay. I think she pulled that bug out of a relay. And that's actual, where else has the term a bug in the computer come from? There's an actual bug in the computer. <laughs> and she documented it many, many years ago. Well, Grace was also a great talker and a great representative to bring a new idea. And I want to show you how you don't need to have fancy, very fancy demonstrations, a simple prop at times at the right place, at the right moment, with the right person who is interested is all you need to have. And who's the right person who's interested in this? 
This is Grace Hopper on The David Letterman Show. When you get people like David Letterman and, and Johnny Carson years ago, Johnny Carson had Carl Sagan on 30 times, probably more than any other person who'd been on that show, because he believed that he could influence the public by uh, getting them to pay attention to science. Well, not too long ago, um, Grace Hopper retired from the Navy. She was the longest single-serving person in the Navy. I think it was 43 years she held the record of being an officer in the Navy, and she retired as a, uh, a rear admiral. And she was on David Letterman a few years ago before she retired. You get to see this and see how old this is. And that was the time when the word nano was just coming into our vernacular. What is a nano something? And so we asked Grace Hopper to come on and explain what a nano was. Is that right? <laughs> More or less. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, that, quite a bit about that. that conjures an image of somebody who has a lot of Tupperware parties somehow. <laughs> Uh, well, I could give you a nanosecond. Okay, now, like I see, to. I don't even know what that is, Grace. Well, you see, we started with milliseconds, thousands of a second, and then we went to microseconds, millionths of a second, and now we talk about nanoseconds. That's a billionth of a second. Mm -hmm. But Well, they told me billionth of a second, and I didn't know what on earth they were talking about. It right. didn't make sense to me. So one day I called over to engineering and said, cut off a nanosecond, send it over to me. <laughs> so I've got a bundle of them here. And you can pick your color. <laughs> oh, they come in color. See, I didn't realize that nanoseconds now. In the old days, you only had your I choice of white or gray, I think. <laughs> now, now, Gracie, I understand that this is a visual... That is the maximum distance that light or electricity can travel in a billionth of a second. No, no faster? No, no, no farther? And, uh, when an admiral asks you why it takes a damn long to send a message by a satellite. Uh -huh. You point out to him that between here and the satellite, there are a very large number of nanoseconds. <laughs> she died in uh, 1992 at the age of 85. You will never forget this demonstration. I predict the next time somebody at the nanosecond is about a foot long, that's how long it takes the light to travel. All you need to find is someone who's willing to help you out and someone with a great demonstration, someone who believes in, in what you're doing. Um, science, long before, long before Falk and Durking discovered that most people are learning this science outside of the mainstream, outside of schools, the entertainment business started discovering this. And entertainment business wants to find where young people are. They started programming science and math, STEM, into their TV shows. If you recall, one of the early TV shows was uh, numbers. It talked about math. There was, a minute in, there was a minute in every numbers show where they actually explained a very interesting mathematical concept. One of the first programs I recall was a flower. They showed the Fibonacci series. It took about 30 seconds. They got some real science in there to explain how mathematics occurred in the Fibonacci series. I think they even did the, the, uh, the uh, exploding Coke bottle experiment with the physics, explain the physics, what was going on inside there. Of course, that morphed into one of the great popular science shows of our times, Mythbusters. It made, uh, it made it popular to blow things up on television. In fact, I did a program called Newton's Apple for many years on PBS. And um, what they wanted to do by that end was blow a lot of things up also. And we, also we all talked about it years later, that if it had stayed, it, had, it would probably have morphed into Mythbusters. But besides just blowing things up, they showed you how to plan and perform an experiment and collect the data and analyze data. And those are very basic things that teaching kids about science. Of course, now we have the Big Bang Theory. And that's a show about physics nerds. How many of you have not seen the Big Bang Theory? Just to, well, well you're going to get to see a little bit of it now. Um, the Big Bang Theory is like Friends. If Friends were all nerdy physicists, that's what the Big Bang Theory would be about. And they discovered the people, this is the most popular, popular program besides news and whatever on CBS. This is the number one rated entertainment show on CBS. And it features a bunch of nerdy physicists. Uh, and I, we got a call, I got a call one day from the producers of the Big Bang Theory saying, we want to put Sheldon Cooper, who was the big nerd on the Big Bang Theory, we want to put him on a radio show, and we couldn't think of a show, and everybody raised their hand and said, Science Friday! So they called me up and said, we want to create a special edition of Science Friday in the, in the TV show where Sheldon could be on. Could you help us out with that? 
And I'll show you a little clip of it now because it's a longer show. And uh, I would always know when it's on TV because people are coming up to me saying, hey, I just saw the rerun of that Bank Bank Theory. And I'll give you a little idea of what was happening. This is Ira Plato, and you're listening to NPR Science Friday. They're feeding nitrogen into Sheldon's office, office because he's the one at the squeak, you know, like a duck. This is going to be a Wyatt. <laughs> so I'm on, he's on my Thanks show on the phone from his today, office. My pleasure, Ira. And he goes on to talk about answering. You'll have to watch it when it comes out. But I know, I'm sorry, I can't show the whole thing. Uh, but the point is, is that, these, is that these people who produce the most popular show on TV are doing it about scientists, and they understand that the public loves science. I just showed you statistics that show the public life likes science. And this is also one of the, uh, you want to talk about the power of celebrities and influencing the future of the science, take this guy. He, uh, you can't be a more popular entertainer on TV than Seth MacFarlane. Now, this is the guy who creates create Family Guy and a bunch of other you know, uh, animated series, and Seth MacFarlane collaborating with Andrean, Carl Sagan's wife, and they're going to produce a new version of Cosmos next year. And they're going to use as their star of the new version of Cosmos, Neil deGrasse Tyson. He's going to take the place of Carl Sagan, and he realizes, not only Carl Sagan, uh, uh, not only Neil deGrasse Tyson, but Seth MacFarlane does Fox stuff, realizes a great thirst and hunger for science, and we need to have more ways of bringing that, and what better person than Neil deGrasse Tyson. Now, some of you may be familiar with the great planet debate <clears throat> that Neil started about Pluto, and I was very fortunate enough to be a host of a debate between Neil and who recognizes this other guy? Mark Sykes. He, I, I refereed a debate between he uh, back in, in Johns Hopkins a few years ago. And to give you an idea of what a great communicator is and how a great communicator is, if you just ask Neil a single question about, about the planets and what's the definition of a planet, this is the answer he gives you. <clears throat> the word planet has lost all scientific value. If, I, if I'm looking for planets around another, in another star system, and I say, I've just discovered a planet. You then have to play 20 questions with me. Is it big? Is it small? Is it rocky? Is it gaseous? Is it rings? Is it a moon? Is it close? Is it far? Is it an inhabitable zone? Might it have water? Is it? And so if I have to ask 20 questions, once I've told you I've discovered a planet, the word has no utility anymore. Of course, if you're sitting next to him, you have to get out of the way. <laughs> and there was an article written by someone in Baltimore about how Ira was ducking all the time from Neil's hands moving in and out of the way. And I don't think Mark Sykes had a chance. Uh, in this debate, but of course, this is, you know, this is someone who knows how to be a public figure and how to bring science to the public in an engaging way and, and very succinctly and, and show the emotion. Of course, not only TV producers are recognizing the popularity of science and how it can draw an audience, but science is also hot in, on films, like this latest film, Losing Control. It's a romantic comedy about a scientist who performs an experiment on her best friend to see if he's marriage material. It, Got, it's, it's playing in theaters around the country, and as the word spreads virally, more and more people want to see it. Science is also popular uh, <clears throat> in other films like The Flash of Genius with, with Greg Kinnear, who talked about the invention of the, the intermittent windshield wiper. I don't know if you saw that movie, but it was a great movie and, and how, we, how to try to get recognition for a patent. On Broadway, science is popular in the Farnsworth invention. This was a, a story about uh, how... Farnsworth was responsible for inventing the TV idea for TV, for, for creating the TV. In it, Hank Azaria actually plays uh, the RCA tycoon David Sarnoff. And I'll tell you, I saw this on Broadway, and when you see Hank Azaria on stage, it's almost impossible not to think of Mo the bartender uh, <laughs> up there because that's what he's famous for. So it's not only popular there, but on off-Broadway, science is finding new life. This is a, a revival of Galileo starring F. Murray Abraham, big-time actor doing an off-Broadway play because people love science and they'll take it wherever they can. Science is also becoming or becoming more popular in artwork. Artist uh, Lynn Feldman of Minneapolis, she creates art inspired by science. She creates giant murals. She'll take your DNA and make a, a beautiful art 
the map out of it, you're tracing the path of your DNA around the world, um, creating artwork about it. We at Science Friday, we recognize that science is a great, is a great motivator when you, when you uh, link it to art, and we've created a whole website part of science and the arts. And here's one little topic we did a few weeks ago. We asked people to send us their leaves. It was being fall. We take a picture of a leaf, and we told them how to put the black background on there. We'll put them up on our website. And we had uh, countless numbers of people submitting, our submitting their photos of their leaves. We put them up there, and it was shared by lots and lots of people. Science is hot in art. In any, another place that science is also hot outside the classroom is in clubs, like the 4-H, which conducts a national science experiment. In this one, they partnered with, the, uh, with Ohio State University. 4-H groups every year do a national science experiment, combine all their talents with these kids. Who ever heard of such a thing? And they, uh, we had the director of the 4-H on one, one day, and I said, you know, 4-H stands for head, heart, hand, and health. I think he could put another H in there. And he said, what? I said, hypothesis. He got, I got about the same response as I'm getting from you. <laughs> okay, we'll go away and think about it. But, you know, it's, it's, it's crowdsourcing. It's using kids. You know that science is hot when it becomes the centerpiece of a White House invitation. And this is the first science fair from a couple of years ago ever held at the White House. It's amazing that science fairs have never been held at the White House. We have the athletes coming to the White House. We don't have scientists being featured at the White House or, or kids. There's one interesting aspect of this photo and why I chose it in particular is the number of young women pictured in the science fair here. The, the numbers of young women joining the ranks or, or, or people trying to get young women interested in science is, is growing more and more. In fact, the Intel Science Talent Search winner for a couple of years ago was Erica De Benedictus of eight, she's 18 from Albuquerque. She was the top winner in the Intel Science Talent Surge. In fact, four of the top finalists were young women. Recognizing this, we're seeing more science-related materials outside of the classroom again aimed at young women. Who remembers Danica McKellar? Yes. She was the actress, <laughs> someone's old enough, she's the actress who played Winnie Cooper on The Wonder Years. She has produced three best-selling books, math books for girls and young women, and she, she had this one here called Hot X, get it, Hot X, Algebra Exposed. And her next one is Girls Get Curves about geometry. Girls Get Curves, Geometry Takes Shape. Women in Physics on the Internet. Deborah Barabishads, who is, uh, does this website, has her own videos about physics for women, including this one about the physics of high heels. You go to that website and click on it. You will learn that the tip of a high heel exerts more pressure on the ground than the whole foot of an elephant does in that one spot. Interesting stuff, trying to, get, trying to show how science of every day life. But my most favorite <laughs> example about it, the ultimate, the ultimate that science is hot, especially among young women, is the 2010 Barbie doll. You know, young women vote for Barbie dolls. They vote for what they'd like to see the Barbie doll of that year be. And in the voting, this is what won out, is the geek. Barbie, the science nerdy geek. And what I like most about it is you, you can see that she has, her, her blouse has a, a little bit of a geeky pattern on it. She's carrying a, a laptop. She was wearing glasses. But the most telling feature for me the sensible shoes. <laughs> These are not pointy little stilettos like the other Barbies might have. She said she's wearing, you know, conservative pants. In fact, uh, you know, science cheerleaders have been trying to get people interested in science for years. They come from, they, 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 co they play for NFL teams, and they, there is... There is one science video that I want to show you, if you haven't seen this, um, that, is, that is made by the European Commission for a campaign designed to attract more women to a, to a career in science. And they said that they wanted to produce a video that had to speak their language, meaning young women, get their attention, and that it was intending to be fun and catchy and strike a chord with young women. And it proved to be very, very controversial. 
I'm going to show it to you. I want to get your opinion about what you think about it. you think? Yeah. yeah? One yeah. This had the shortest life on, this had the shortest life on YouTube of any video. This, this disappeared faster than cold fusion. Let me tell you, there are people who hated this because of the stereotype they considered it showing negative stereotype of, of young women. This is not the kind of science or we, these are not the kind of uh, images we want to have as scientists and young women. Instead, some people came up with an alternative. This is the Barber Lab Quartet, and it's singing about the coral triangle of the South Pacific, explaining how species diverge if they're left alone to, diver to go by themselves. And I'm going to give you, this is a, totally, a little bit of a different flavor of the way some people think that science and women in science should be portrayed. A different view. I think I know which one you prefer to see, but maybe there's room for all of them. But the, the point being is that, you know, science is, is working in different places and it's not being, the, this video is not showing up in schools. So what you want, how do we communicate all this stuff? How do you go out and help us as, as journalists and help yourselves communicate it? First, you'll have to learn how to speak in plain English or plain language, whatever language you're going to be speaking in. You can't go out there and learn how to speak and, and go out with jargon all the time and, and, and do what you, what, what you want to do. You have to learn to certainly say it's certainty. If it's there, say it's there. You know, don't, don't be wishy-washy if you, if you think it's really happening. Be ready for a talk show food fight. If you're going on a talk show, be, understand where you're going, that there's gone, they're not interested in actually create, understanding the middle part of that. They, they want to create opposing views and polarized views, and that's be ready for having to stick to your point of view and, and, your, and your talking points of what you want to communicate. Talk to your local media scientists, the media, meteorologists at your local TV stations are very, if you can, if you can, if they, well, if you can convince them that global warming is real, <laughs> which a lot of them do not believe in, um, then you've made a point, but these are the, probably the people who are closest to, to uh, you know, our scientists. Some of them are, have, are, you know, have degrees in meteorology. They're always looking for an excuse. Um, and get, in, and get involved in examining science and the arts. So here are a couple of, don't speak in foreign languages when you talk. 
Make sure you're speaking English. Get ready for that food fight that's going to happen when you, get on, when you get on TV. Understand that you can't convince people. You can't convince people if they don't want to believe that the Earth is not 6,000 years old. There's really nothing you're going to say in the long run that is going to convince them otherwise. Go out to where the people are. Partner with other organizations. Uh, I know that you have the, the Maker Fair here, around in, out in San Francisco. Find out where those kids are going to make affairs. There are, there are incredible resources that shows you the creativity that youngsters have. Again, I say get to know your local TV weatherman. Get out there and talk about it. This is one of your own climate scientists plan campaign against global warming skeptics. American Geophysical Union plans to announce that 700 researchers have have uh, agreed to speak out on the issue. Learn how to speak out. Learn what it is to speak out. Practice speaking. Practice saying your message. You actually get in front of a TV camera and get, you know, you're going to get eight seconds if you're lucky in front of a, uh, for a news. If somebody interviews you for the evening news or, you know, understand if you get 15 seconds, that's a long, long, long time in the TV business. You know, and when somebody says to you, Take a politician to lunch. Talk to them. If they claim they can't understand the mysteries, explain it to them in plain English. If they don't believe you, bring in an oil industry expert along with you and have he or she explain that the oil they drill off, the, where they drill it, that uh, took millions of years to form. I have the oil people say that. And without the earth billions of years old that created the, the oil, the oil companies would have no money to fund their next election campaign with. So, it's one of the great mysteries of, of the happen. And, you know, there are, bring, the, bring, bring performances of science in the media, in, uh, in uh, theater and arts to your local communities. Frequency hopping. Interesting story about Hedy Lamarr and how she was, res helped res was responsible for developing the idea behind uh, cell phones and, and, uh, and, and other kinds of wireless phones. An Enemy of the People just finished bro uh, running on Broadway. It's a terrific play by Henrik Ibsen. It's about scientists facing a challenge in public policy. It's only 130 years old, but I tell you it could have been written yesterday by issues. Bring these plays to your local communities. Bring them to where you live. Create a science film festival. Help sponsor a science film festival where you see new filmmakers making films about science. Create science and art things like we have on Science Friday. Create other science and art web pages and, and bring them out to your local communities. And then help us create videos with you. We are looking for raw footage of stuff, and we will help you make videos at Science Friday of the kind of work that you do. And I'm going to show you one or two of the most popular ones, short educational ones. They last only about three minutes. This is our biggest classic. It's called Where is the Octopus? And it combines nature and science in a way that we like to call is our style. Watch very carefully. I have to admit I was screaming when I got this video thing. What makes a marine biologist scream? Roger Hanlon captured this about 10 years ago. He was doing a study in the Caribbean and he'd been following this octopus for about an hour. When it crept behind the rock and went into camouflage mode, he jammed the camera down right in its face, so to speak, prompting it to go from camouflage to a startle defense. Blanching white very quickly. And then inking him. But I followed the animal and finished the dive, and I popped at the surface. It was only about five feet deep, and I screamed bloody murder, and they thought I was having a dive accident. When actually he was having... It was a eureka moment, there's no doubt about it. And that's because Hanlon is trying to understand just how camouflage works in cephalopods. Yes, yeah, cephalopods, squid, octopus, and cuttlefish. They are masters of optical illusion. They are the animals best known to go anywhere in camouflage. No animal comes even close to the speed and diversity of appearances of this animal. And they have a few tricks at their disposal. Octopus and cuttlefish can change their skin texture. This is the only animal group we know of that has 
fine control of its skin to create the bumpiness. And they match their skin dimensionality by sight, not by touch, which a is a vexing visual perception question. And of course, they change color. So here's an octopus. Doing what we call the moving rock trick. I'm a rock, I'm a rock. Now watch this. So the amazing thing is that these animals are colorblind, yet they are capable of creating color match patterns. But we don't know how. But of course Hamlin would like to. And one way he's studying this is by looking closely at squid skin. That's what you're seeing here. These are super close-up images of live unanesthetized squid. And so we create, we take your videos, and we create, help take your raw footage, and we create other videos. We have hundreds of these on our website. There's a video about... This is a computer that uses bubbles instead of electrons to, to compute. We took the scientist's video about this, and we turned it into a, we turned it into a video. And it's, where, you have a vi where you have a bubble, it's a one. Where you don't have a bubble, it's a zero. It's, a, it's, it's computing versus bubbles. We, we explained the physics of, during the Olympics were coming up, the physics of the high jump, because it was really interesting you how you're able to go backwards over the high jump bar like project. that. And we and actually talked to the scientist, and he showed us that it's your center of mass getting over the bar. This path is called a parabola. The center of mass is the average location of all the body mass, sort of here-ish. However, for one given parabola, that does not guarantee what height you're going to clear. Because although the center of mass is in the same place for these two jumpers, this guy's legs would hit the bar. That's why you have to get horizontal. And if you curve your body enough, your center of mass could theoretically be passing under the bar, but your pelvis is going over the bar. Mid-jump, jackknife the legs up, and you're done. All in about... Oh, ballpark, about one second to complete the whole jump. And it turns out that that second is actually sort of the easy part, Topena says, because once you leave the ground... The whole path of the projectile is determined. There's nothing you can do to change the path of that projectile. So all the spectacular things you see in the bar clearance... Those are mainly an effect of everything that happened in the run-up and in the takeoff. As usual, if you want to reach great heights, it's the groundwork that counts. And so we, um, we take all kinds of videos. We, we did a video of candy in corn space, in space. To bring some Don Pettit actually in. showing you a, how a Come water molecule can, using candy corn, you can, you can imitate how soap works. I, I won't play the whole video for you because you can go on our website and watch it. But he created a big blob of water and started filling it up with candy corn and imitated what a uh, soap molecule had on. One end it liked water, one end it liked the oil, and put it together and created a giant blob in space and took it apart, and it was, it was really kind of interesting. We're very happy. We, loved, we are going out there. We're sending our videos on YouTubes, uh, YouTube, uh, other, our website, any place. We can give them away to schools. We make teaching materials out of them. If you, when you research, like the oceanographer, like a, the, the astronauts here, have videos that you need some help with, that you like, that we'll add, add value to, and we'll put them on our website. These are, you know, these are downloaded millions of times a year, and we're very happy to help you out. I just want to leave you with one last thought before I finish. Brings me back to this old scientist, uh, Einstein, and about encouraging young people to become scientists. Now, we all love this, pic this iconic picture of Einstein, but I want you to get rid of this picture because he was a no Einstein as a student. That really wasn't an Einstein, and it wasn't really the, the, the kind of picture that people want to emulate, that kids and youngsters want to emulate because this is really what Einstein looked like when he was in his, his 20s. This is the real Einstein. Look at those penetrating eyes. He's got that come-hither stance, that's, right? You know, because if we talk, as I talk today about science being sexy again, you can see way back, over 100 years ago, in the past heyday of science back then, that you can actually see that science really was sexy back then also. Thank you very much for inviting me to talk today. Yeah. <laughs> I know some people have to leave early. They're streaming out to get their turtlenecks at Macy's. <laughs>
<laughs> so uh, we do have time for questions, and I, I realize that some of you do have to leave, and, uh, and that's okay, but we will stay uh, for a few minutes anyways, and if there are questions, uh, it's a little bit hard to see up here uh, with the lights up, but um, yeah, is, are, are there microphones there in, yeah. in the aisles? Okay, so if anybody has a question, there's a mic over here. Yes. It's on, yes. Oh, great. Thanks, Ira. It's, it's okay to show a lot of video about guys being sexy in science, too, next time. <laughs> there's one right there. <laughs> well, I started off with Spalbach. No, I thought you... I th but Dowsey's pretty good. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, I, my question actually comes from a, a news article my daughter and I read recently. She's 13. And uh, the idea was Toys R Us wants to expand in China. And they had to increase by tenfold the amount of science-driven toys to appeal to the market in China, particularly to girls. And my third child looked at me and she said, Mommy, that's outrageous. How can we not have that here in America? So I will ask you my daughter's question. That's outrageous. How, 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 how are we where we are? I think that, you know, I agree with you. People love science. You go away, they will talk about science as much as a chance as you give them everywhere I go, everywhere a radio show goes. I didn't, bring, I didn't have enough time to show our podcast audience. We have about 2 million people a week who listen and podcast Science Friday, and they love to talk about it. Now that the entertainment industry has discovered this and, and the thirst that people have for science, there are lots of other toys out there. There are science toys out there. You just have to know where to find them. You know, with the Internet, it's not hard to find them. And I think that um, maybe we'll see more of them, you know, in the malls, instead of those flying helicopters just uh, <laughs> taking up all that space. Yes, anybody else have a... Over there, yes. Hi. Uh, part of the... I liked what you were saying earlier about encouraging people to speak to the public more about science as professionals, but do you think you need to push that message to the uh, established professionals, like the tenure committees and the graduate committees, to accept or encourage people who are not secure in their scientific professions yet to be able to go out and speak comfortably and spend time away from research sharing that information with uh, the public. You know, I, I, I mentioned Carl Sagan, and you, you know, many of you may not remember when he was alive, but he was vilified for being a scientist and speaking out in public about science because he said, people were saying, you're not a real scientist. Real scientists don't go out and talk to the public. And he went out and talked to the public anyhow and was very successful at it. I don't, I, this, is a, this is a question you have to decide amongst yourself, talk amongst yourselves, you know, because if, if you want the public to get both sides of the story, especially since science has become a political football and science has become a matter of opinion now, you know, who says square root of 16 is 4? That's your opinion, you know? Um, <laughs> then, you have, then you have to go out and make an effort to do that. And I think that's something that you have to, you know, decide for yourself. Uh, marvelous talk. Um, uh, we have another problem, though. Uh, at, e even though our children might be finding science to be exciting, uh, those who make judgments in Congress have other uh, thoughts. Uh, I come from a state where uh, uh, one of our representatives who ran, ran uh, unchallenged um, is on the um, uh, House Science and Technology Committee. He's a 6,541-year-er. Uh, he um, uh, <laughs> does not believe in evolution. All these things are uh, issuing from hell to take one away from the thoughts of the Savior. How do you do anything about those people? It's very hard, and I'm not sure you can. You cannot convince anybody who's really made up their mind to change their minds. The only way to do that is to vote at the ballot box, and, and people you know, want to decide that they'd rather have someone whose facts are more science-based uh, in power. There are always going to be those people around. And, um, it's up to the public. I get, I get asked this question a lot on the radio. What do I do? I said, well, you have the power to vote, you know? That's, that's the way you exercise it. Yes? Am I next? Who's next? Uh, we have one over here. Uh, over there. Over here. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, hi, yeah. So I'm an undergrad right now. Um, and I had, a, I had a question about where you think the disconnect happens between everybody really appreciating scientists and kind of putting them on a pedestal and really liking science and not going into science. Right, because a lot of kids don't go into science. So why do you think that is? I think a lot of kids don't go into science is because, and if you ask people who are in science their whole lives and made careers about it, it's because they had a mentor. They had somebody along the way, a teacher, could be a parent even, 
Uh, someone, I know I certainly did. I didn't become a scientist. I have an engineering degree, but I, you know, I went into broadcasting. Um, but I certainly had my eighth grade teacher, Mrs. Pfeffer, you know, at a science club and allowed me to do experiments that I would eventually try to burn down my bathroom with or something like that. Um, but some, you need, I think you need to, you know, when, when a kid takes a, a Pop-Tart and sticks it in the VCR slot, you know, you know that's an experiment. Kids start, out, <laughs> kids, kids start out as natural scientists, so we have to find a way of channeling that and helping these kids you know, keep their curiosity, and we also have to teach them how to be critical thinkers. We should be teaching critical thinking in school, not just how to be a scientist, I think. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for that wonderful, wonderful talk. Uh, I'm just trying to reconcile what happened in my past with uh, exposure to the media of the generation that I am, uh, 40s, 50s. Uh, I can think of several films that portrayed science in a very positive light, but also the concept that society was going to answer these questions. Uh, one would be Fantasia by Walt Disney, the final sequence with uh, Box, Toccata, and Fugue about uh, uh, how the earth got going. Excuse me, I'm wrong. That was uh, uh, how the earth became... Uh, yeah, I know um, the movie. I know the mo I mean, it wasn't I, I, a wrong yeah. piece of music, uh, right. but nonetheless. Uh, others where scientists were portrayed as heroes uh, would be uh, War of the Worlds, the original. Right. The scientists right. were going to... Gene gonna Barry. Uh, Gene Barry and War of the Worlds. And finally culminating in 2001 where they took extraordinary uh, uh, lengths to justify what they were doing. There was one scene where uh, the, the astronaut uh, has to get back into... Right. Uh, uh, open the pod open, bay door. Right. And there was a vacuum and they actually handed out uh, uh, a flyer about survival in a vacuum for a minute. Right. Uh, but it, there was the concept of we're going there. Society's going there. Is there anything like that now? Yes, there was a movie very recently called Contagion. Scientists are the heroes. The federal scientists are the heroes in contain, Contagion of solving the, the crisis that was killing everybody, coming up with a vaccine. And they were very much, I think, you know, uh, the heroes in that film. And... Um, set a stage for people seeing a heroic version of what scientists can do. It was, it was Stravinsky, The Rights of Stravinsky, Spring. Rights of Spring. And I can never... And you know, speaking of, speaking of Disney, back in the 50s, Werner von Braun was right. all over Disney talking about space, you know, and how we were going to get to the moon in, in a positive light. Yes? Hi, Ira. This is Elsa Velasco from the Society of Exploration Geophysicists. And I do have a note that the, uh, I work for students and young professionals. And one of the key things that I do tell my girls, as I call them, is uh, you can go hard at those rocks and work with oil and gas, but I want to see you looking good. And one of the examples is six-inch heels over here. So there you go. Girls uh, have to look good, too. Uh, um, Danica McKellar would be right on your side. I yes. Know. And I do have a question. Um, I work with young professionals, and we have a lot of migration. They start the career, and midway they go for psychology, for example. And I happen to think that geophysics is awesome. Uh, and something is happening along the way. We do videos, we do a lot of outreach, but what else are we missing the ball? Because I need to have more people involved in the science. Well, aren't women afraid, or not afraid is the wrong word, they're, they're faced with a decision about having a family, more than men are. And I, from what I can read, I can tell that women drop out of science to take time off to have the families. They want to be at home. Some of them, not all of them, want to be at home and, and parent their kids. And they, I, I'm told that that's where these things sort of drop through. That's why women are, what is your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think so. The thing is that I, when I see my, my ladies, mo, more of them are making the decision of starting a family at 40. Right. So I think, I don't even know if it's this connectivity thing. Geophysics is heavy on data and they just want to do the 140 character thing. But something is happening that, you know, we have less females, and we really have to push the message. I, I don't have an answer. I wish I had an answer for that. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not a scientist. I don't even play one on the radio. But, <laughs> you know, I, there, I think no one has the real answer to that, and that's the problem. I mean, people need to be thinking more about it. But we uh, will send you videos. Yes, please. Look, one more over here. Um, we're on verge of writing for the first time a set of national science standards, the next generation science standards, 
And uh, incidentally, it will involve, uh, looks like a year of earth science at both, earth and space science, both at middle school and at high school. Right. I was wondering if you have any advice for us in the yes. process. I have two bits, uh, to my last two comments today. One is I think we should teach science not like everybody's going to be a scientist. We should teach science like we teach art. When you learn art, you, they don't expect you to become Picasso. They teach you why Picasso is a good artist, what makes him, what is history of it, what the arc of his life, how it fits into society, why it's important. We don't ever teach science like that. We don't teach science how it affects your life, what scientists do, what they're for, how to appreciate them, just in general what being a scientist is about. We think you're going to have to be trained to be a scientist somewhere along the way. We need to treat I think so, we need to treat curricula. We should create a curriculum for kids who are not going to be scientists and never will be and how to appreciate science. Most people like scientists. I love scientists. They haven't the slightest idea what they do. And my second suggestion is, and I'll say this is my wrap-up, if you want to make science popular and you want to become, the, become part of the public discussion, the place you really have to go is where everybody goes, the national holiday, which is the Super Bowl. If you want to show that science is in there with everybody else who is advertising on the Super Bowl, you have to create an ad about science in the Super Bowl. And you have to show all, you have to, a slideshow of maybe 60 different things flashing by. Who made all of these things possible? We did. We're scientists. And if you get that to show, shown where people know it's going to be viewed along with the other stuff, then science is playing in the game where everybody else is playing, and it shows how relevant and important they are to the rest of the world. Thank you very much for coming by. Thank you, Ira, for a very stimulating and uh, very interesting and provocative presentation. Thank you all for coming, and uh, enjoy the rest of the meeting.